Gauss-Jordan elimination is a sequence of elementary row operations done to transform a matrix into its reduced row echelon form, which can then be used to solve the system of linear equations that it represents. Today, we'll go over a step-by-step -step process for carrying out Gauss-Jordan elimination. We'll also see how to use it to actually solve a system of linear equations, and we'll do three examples. Chapters are in the description if you want to skip around. I should mention that Gauss-Jordan elimination is just Gaussian elimination, but with an additional step. So if you've seen my lesson on Gaussian elimination, link in the description, this will be slightly redundant. But for completeness, I'm going to go through every step and assume that you either didn't see that video or you just need some review. Also link in the description to my lesson on the reduced row echelon form of a matrix. Let's begin with this step-by-step -step example from Howard Anton's linear algebra text showing us how to carry out Gauss-Jordan elimination. Here is our matrix. It may represent a system of linear equations, though it doesn't have to. Step one is to locate the leftmost column that doesn't consist entirely of zeros. In this case, that's column one. It's not all zeros, so we're we're starting there. Step two is to get a non-zero number to the top of this column. So we need to interchange the top row with another row to bring a non-zero entry to the top of the column. In this case, we'll interchange the first row with the second row. Now we have a two at the top of that non-zero column. Remember, our goal is to get the matrix into reduced row echelon form. That's what Gauss-Jordan elimination is all about, which means, among other things, that the leading entry of a non-zero row needs to be one. So, step three is to get a leading one. If our entry at the top of the column is, say, A, we need to multiply that first row by one over A. In this case, we multiply by one over two. So now we have a one at the top as desired. The four becomes a two, negative 10 becomes negative five, and so on. And now that we have a one at the top of this column, we can add suitable multiples of this top row to the rows below it so that everything below the leading one becomes a zero. That's what we're doing in step four. So we add negative two times row one to row three in order to turn this two into a zero. We of course are adding negative two times the whole row to row three. So the four also becomes a zero, the negative five becomes positive five, and so on. Then step five is pretty much just to repeat the process. We're done with the top row, so you can kind of cover it up, and then begin again at step one with the submatrix that remains. We identify the leftmost column that doesn't contain only zeros, and then we want to make sure that we have a non-zero number at the top of that column. In this case, we do. We have negative two at the top. So we skip to step three, which is to make that number at the top a one. So we multiply by negative one half. We multiply this whole row by that. So this first entry becomes one, and then we have negative seven halves and negative six. And again, now that we have a one here, we want to add multiples of row two to the rows below it so that everything below this leading one becomes a zero. In this case, we just have to add negative five times this row to row three in order to get rid of this five. Once we do that, we have zeros below the leading one. And remember, we're working with the entire row, so we also have negative five times negative six, which is 30, gets added to negative 29, which gives us positive one. And of course, we've got action going on here with the fractions too. And then again, we repeat the process. Cover up row two, we're done with that now. Identify the leftmost non-zero column, which is this one. Turn it into a leading one by doubling the row, and that gets us here. And we have now completed step five. At this point, the matrix is in row echelon form. If we were simply performing Gaussian elimination, we would be done. We've completed a sort of forward phase of getting leading ones and eliminating the entries below them. But for Gauss-Jordan elimination, to achieve reduced row echelon form, we need to also complete a sort of backward phase where we introduce zeros above the leading ones as well. So here's step six. Beginning with the last non-zero row and working upward, add suitable multiples of each row to the rows above to introduce zeros above the leading ones. In our case, the last non-zero row is row three. We're working from bottom to top. So we'll take seven halves times the third row and then add it to the second row. That way we get rid of this negative seven halves above the one. 
then we need to add negative 6 times the third row to the first row to get rid of that 6 that's above the leading one. And that gets us to this matrix here. Finally, we add 5 times the second row to the first row to get rid of that negative 5. And now we have completed the Gauss-Jordan elimination. This matrix is in reduced row echelon form. All zero rows are at the bottom. In this case, there are none. The non-zero rows all have leading ones, and each column with a leading one has zeros everywhere else. Also, each leading one occurs further to the right than the leading one above it. So we have completed the Gauss-Jordan elimination, and we can write the system of linear equations that this matrix represents. And here it is. This is how we reach a solution using Gauss-Jordan elimination. This is the set of equations that comes from the reduced row echelon form matrix. You can see I left a gap here because the first row, for example, has zero x3s, and a gap here because the first row has zero x5s. The last column, of course, are the constants. Now we need to solve for the leading variables. Those are just the variables in the front. So we leave x1 by itself and subtract everything else. x1 then equals 7 minus 2x2 minus 3x4. x3 and x5 are already solved. x3 is 1 and x5 is 2. Thus, we can describe our solution set with parametric equations. x2 and x4 we can see are free variables. They have no restrictions. So we'll say x2 is the parameter r and x4 is s. Then our solution is described by these equations. x1 equals 7 minus 2r minus 3s. x2 is r, x3 is 1, x4 is s and x5 is 2. All solutions to the original system of linear equations can be found by plugging in various values for r and s into this set of equations. So that's Gauss-Jordan elimination and how we can use it to solve a system of linear equations. Let's go through another example. Here is a system of three linear equations. We want to solve it using Gauss-Jordan elimination. I've pasted the steps here for your reference. We begin by writing the augmented matrix representing the system. I've also got a little dotted line here to separate the constants from the coefficients just because it looks nice. All right, now step one is to locate the leftmost column that does not consist entirely of zeros. In this case, that's column one. Notice that at the top of column one, we already have a one, which is exactly what we want. So we can move all the way down to step four. We need to add suitable multiples of this top row to the rows below it. So all the entries below the leading one become zero. To that end, we'll add row one to row two to get rid of that negative one. We'll also subtract three copies of row one from row three to get rid of that three. And that gets us here. We now just have to focus on this submatrix that is below row one. The leftmost non-zero column is this one, and it has a non-zero entry at its top. Now we just need to turn that non-zero entry into a one. To do that, we multiply this second row by negative one. Doing that gets us here. So now we've got that leading one we desire, and we can add suitable multiples of row two to the rows below it to introduce zeros below the leading one. In this case, that means we're going to add 10 copies of row two to row three in order to get rid of that negative 10. Doing that gets us to this matrix here. We then simply multiply row three by negative one over 52 in order to turn this entry into a positive one. One, and that gets us here. The matrix is now in row echelon form, and we just have to complete step six, the backward phase of introducing zeros above the leading ones. We work from bottom to top. So we'll begin by adding five copies of row three to row two. That way we get rid of this negative five. We'll also subtract two copies of row three from row one to get rid of that two above the leading one. Doing both of those things gets us here. You can see we now have zeros all above that leading one. Now we can focus on this leading one in row two. We'll subtract row two from row one in order to get rid of this entry that's above that leading one. That gets us here, and this matrix is now in reduced row echelon form. We've completed the Gauss-Jordan elimination. The solution to this system of linear equations is a single solution, x1 equals three, x2 equals 1, and x3 equals 2.
Let's quickly look at one more example, just for more practice writing a general solution with parametric equations. Here is a system of four linear equations, and here is the coefficient matrix. We have all the coefficients, and in the last column, we have the constants. Now, if you carry out Gauss-Jordan elimination on this matrix, you can verify for yourself that we get this reduced row echelon form matrix. And this reduced row echelon form matrix corresponds to this system of linear equations. If we solve for the leading variables, which are just the ones in the front, we get that x1 equals negative 3x2 minus 4x4 minus 2x5, x3 equals negative 2x4, and x6 equals 1 third. We can see from these equations that x2, x4, and x5 are all free variables. They have no restrictions. So we'll set those equal to a few parameters and write our general solution. And there it is. We say that x2 is r, x4 is s, and x5 is t. And then this system of equations corresponds to this general solution set. And that's really it. That's how you use Gauss-Jordan elimination to transform a matrix into its reduced row echelon form, and how you can use this process to solve a system of linear equations. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description. Thanks for watching.